So we are gathered here for the annual solar oration, which this year will be delivered by Professor Renata Egan, and um, she will talk shortly. Um, traditionally, we have um, the, the ACT Minister for Energy giving a talk, but he's slightly delayed, so we're going to invert things. We're going to go straight into the oration, and then uh, the minister will deliver five or six minutes on the subject of um, Canberra's move to 100% renewables and zero emissions, and then we'll go into the Q&A and um, we'll wrap up at, at the advertised time. So I'd just like to um, acknowledge the Ngunnawal and, and Ngambri people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today and pay respects to the elders uh, past and present. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Renata and um, rather than me introduce her, perhaps I would ask her to introduce herself because she knows herself much better than I do. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Um, I've, Andrew and I have known each other for a long time, so it's not that he doesn't know me, <laughs> that he's not able to make this introduction. Uh, so I am currently the, I have just in the last three or four months taken on the leadership of the Australian Centre for Advanced Photovoltaics, which is a national research centre. I'll talk a little bit about it lately, uh, later. Um, that's uh, run from the University of New South Wales, but includes all the leading research uh, institutions around the country, in particular ANU, which is really we're equal partners just in the, in the project. Uh, and it also includes Monash and Melbourne, University of Queensland, CSIRO, and now the University of Sydney. Uh, so I've been at the University of New South Wales for about 10 years. And before that, uh, I was in industry, in the solar industry, 20 years in the industry, in, initially in Australia and then in Germany, and then working with China, uh, watching the industry grow from um, zero to hero. Uh, so it's been an exciting ride the last 20 years, and I think the next 20 years is going to be more exciting. And I hope to tell you a little bit about that as we go through the evening. So let me see if I can make this work. Okay. Uh, so uh, Minister Rattenbury will be here later. <laughs> we'll come back to him. Okay. Oh, I'm also Deputy Head of School at the University of New South Wales in the School of Photovoltaics, Renewable Energy Engineering, and my role is in industry and engagement because I come from industry. And I am the co-founder of a company called Solar Analytics, which uh, is Australia's largest independent energy monitoring provider, mostly focused on energy for solar homeowners. Okay, so uh, today I want to talk, um, I was asked what I wanted to speak about, uh, and I, I and uh, I'm very, of course, I'm very interested in solar and the, the change that we have been through, and what is ahead of us. And it's literally generational. The change it's taken 20, it's 20 years to get here. We have another 20 years ahead of us, and over that time frame, we're going to see some really significant changes. Uh, there's where there's pushback. I think my message is always, it's generational. We don't doesn't have to happen overnight but it has to happen. And the sooner it happens, the better the outcomes are gonna be. So I've, that's why I called it generation change and, um, and the role of solar PV. And it's a leading role. We really expect solar to be the dominant source of energy in this country. Uh, and for at least 50% of the energy in most, of the, most parts of the world by 2050 and beyond. Um, so Australia has made, uh, a commitment finally uh, to net zero by 2050. Uh, I note, uh, I read I, in, in preparing for this um, talk, I actually had quite a bit of, I took the time, which I don't often have the time to, to take, uh, to read the, the literature and the conversations that I picked up this piece on net zero um, by 2050 being too late. And it's, this is, I do think it's true. And it's actually interesting to know that the, while this, Federal government has said 2050, the states are all more ambitious. Uh, and historically, the states have actually led and pulled Australia along. So I'm optimistic that we'll, um, we'll actually have some statewide leadership, which uh, is going to get us closer to net zero 
before 2050, closer to maybe 2035, we'll see. Uh, when we talk about emissions, um, those emissions, uh, this, and I've borrowed a lot from the group called Rewiring Australia, which is probably familiar to anybody who's interested in this space. Uh, this is an initiative run or started by a fellow called Saul Griffiths, um, who has had a, a reasonable influence in the politics of uh, decision making in the US around electrification. And he's an Australian who's come back here to, to promote the same message here and is running this organisation called Rewiring Australia and is looking at electrifying everything with a focus on starting with households. And part of this messaging will come through. Uh, most of our emissions are predominantly from in energy. So that's energy for electricity, but also transport and heating and cooking. Otherwise, smaller amounts in agriculture and industrial processes. So with a focus on where we can have the biggest impact, we focus on energy and we say in energy, there we have about 40% of our energy is consumed um, by in household activities, around 30% in commercial activities and some 20% in manufacturing and construction. So again, if we focus on what you and I can do um, at a residential level, we can start to make change. And once, we, once we're seeing that impact, then there's the commercial and, and um, manufacturing has the opportunity to follow as well. Uh, we've working at household level, we've actually already seen significant change. So Australia is leading the world in its uptake of rooftop solar with 30% of households, freestanding homes around Australia now are now powered by rooftop solar. That's remarkable. And it's made, been made possible by a, a few things. One is the precipitous, precipitous drop in the price of solar, which has made it really the lowest cost form of energy. So if you can, you should have solar on your roof. Uh, the, um, in addition, some, some forward thinking and some bipartisanship in government set us up with some energy targets, uh, uh, the renewable energy targets that allowed support for small scale solar and large scale solar, which drove a lot of change in Australia some 20 years ago. Um, and it set us up for this, uh, for these world leading um, role in rooftop solar. We, solar is now incredibly low in price, and I'll cover some, some of that shortly. But because we have gained this experience, Australia now has some of the lowest processes around installing the solar. So for us to put solar on our roofs in Australia, uh, it'll cost for the average system size now is around nine kilowatts, and that will cost around either $9,000 or less to put solar on your rooftop. So what we would call a dollar a watt. Um, and in the, just a moment. Oh, uh, sure. Thank you. Um, so uh, in the US, the, the, the same product costs, instead of a dollar a watt, costs between $2.50 and $3 a watt. It's just, it's phenomenal. What we have learned by doing in Australia has been really impactful. So more than anywhere else in the world. And as a result, uh, Australia now um, delivers 15% of its uh, total electricity needs from solar. So about two thirds of the solar or 20% of that comes from our rooftops and about 10% is solar that's deployed at large scale in the field. Uh, we've been slower on the large scale solar than the rest of the world because, because of the way those incentives were set up. Uh, and as a result, um, solar in the field, interestingly, is more expensive than solar on your rooftop. Not only is it more expensive to deploy, but you then actually have to pay for the transmission to your home. So another re reason why rooftop solar is so cost effective in Australia. All right, my click is not working anymore. Is there a reason that? Okay, it is. Right. Oh, what was it? Have I gone through about 10 slides? Because they're two different computers. Oh, okay. Oh, now I go backwards. Okay. Now you've seen all my slides. <laughs> um, no, I'm get, this, I'm, this is going to get confusing, so I'll just wing it. <laughs> okay. So, right. Uh, when, when we first started putting solar out there, this the image in the top left-hand corner there is the, one of the first 
accredited grid scale connections in Australia. And it went in in 1992, it was three kilowatts. And the people who put it in had to apply to be a, um, a, a power generator using the same application process that a coal fire plant had to um, apply. It took them two years to get approval. So it was connected in 1994, having been installed in 1992. Um, and the reason was because the grid operator thought the, um, grid, that the system would fall over if you had solar installed. That was your first three kilowatts installed on the grid and they still say it. <laughs> so we're, we're pushing more and more solar into the grid and the, the grid and the engineering is adapting as the amount of solar is being installed. It's not happening overnight, it's happening slowly and we're working and we're solving the problems as they occur. Uh, these are, this tipping point was in 2017. I think in 2019 was the excess solar is gonna cause blackouts uh, and the same conversation is happening now. We're gonna to continue to do that. We have what is 30% um, of rooftops with solar now, 15% of our energy. We need to take that to over 50% of our energy from solar. So we're gonna to have to keep engineering solutions to the challenges. It's, it's true, there's solar on the grid provides, pro creates challenges, but they're engineering challenges and the challenges that many people in the room are, are interested in, in taking on and solving. It's part of what we do is to address those challenges as they arise. Uh, so this is a, a little bit of the journey and I, there's two ways to look at it that I wanna take you on. And that is uh, how rapidly we have changed the amount of solar that's on the grid and how we have to keep that up and in fact, push it harder. So in 1992, we had three megawatts of solar on the grid. Is that what it says? Yes, that was when the seven kilowatts was put on. There was a total historically installed of three megawatts in 1992. By 2000, that was 30 megawatts. By 2009, 300 megawatts. Those are the little bubbles. You can see they're growing and they are scaled appropriately. Uh, by 2013, we had three gigawatts of solar installed. And to, sorry, and by now, 2022, last year, we hit 30 gigawatts of solar. So we've actually been increasing by a factor of 10, the amount of solar in our grids every eight or so years. So for our, to achieve our targets of 80% uh, of, uh, of energy on the grid as renewables by 2030, and to get to our net zero targets, we need to, to, to support our current activities of our levels of, of energy consumption, we need to get to 300 gigawatts. But that's only a tenfold increase. And we've been doing tenfold increases every eight years. So we can do it. We just have to keep the momentum up that we've currently got. Uh, to try and understand what the future looks like, we can look at what we've currently got. And while we have 30% of rooftops around Australia with solar on the roof, and we're managing with that, if we actually go and dive down, we'll find there are quite a few large areas where we're already at 65% of rooftops with solar on the roof. And this is a map that you can all look at, at, you, in, at your leisure on the Australian PV Institute's website that actually tracks where all the solar has gone in and, in and around Australia. And the little graphic on the bottom right hand corner shows you um, percentages up to 70%. And the, the deep red you'll find in Adelaide and Brisbane, there's vast areas that have more than 60% rooftop penetration of solar. And the grids are managing with that really significant penetration of rooftop solar. Uh, the particular suburb that's shown there is 65%, I think, if you can see the box in the top corner. Uh, in and around the ACT, I had a quick look. Um, the, uh, in, in the centre of the ACT, it's quite typical in small in cities and in developed cities that the centre, the older housing stock in the centre is has there's a little less rooftop penetration, so 25% or so in the centre, and out um, in uh, Tuggeranong, I think, have I got, yeah, um, upwards, close to 40% penetration of rooftop solar. So as it happens, the ACT is roughly 30%, so representative of the nation when you look at, at, um, at across the ACT. 
So um, uh, the ACT is definitely um, represented, you know, well represented. And I know that um, as a state government, the ACT is really proactive around renewable energy. And we'll hear about that from, um, from Minister Rattenberg later. So the question is why? So I mentioned earlier the initiatives and incentives that the governments have put in place, but one of the real the key drivers is that the phenomenal drop in the price of solar that we've been seeing over the last decades. Uh, this goes back to the 1980s, I think. So in, around, in and around 1995, when I started working in solar, uh, the price of solar was around $20 a watt. And for me, that was a, I had a science training and solving the, and a material science background and solving the, the materials problems with solar was, and for Australia made so much sense. That's what drove me into solar. By 2005, when we had a technology that was ready to take into manufacturing and we took it into manufacturing in Germany, the price of solar was $2 a watt. So 2005, we went off to Germany. I spent a couple of years in Germany uh, de uh, developing this technology at $2 a watt. By the time we've been there for two years, the market price of solar was $1.20 a watt. And it, so the, the solar, you can actually see the bumps in the curve. Um, there are times when there's a supply shortage and prices go up and lots of people invest and then this problem is solved and the, the price plummets again. Uh, so that happened at around 2005. It happened again in 2008 with a global financial crisis and it's happened just recently around COVID that there was, a, there was supply shortages, prices went up and now they've dropped uh, precipitously again. So that in bef just before COVID, the price of solar had got to 20 cents a watt. And now we're seeing prices, incredible prices like 12, 13, 14 cents a watt. I honestly don't know how it, they're doing it. Uh, but it does, it's just phenomenal. The change has been phenomenal and we have, there's every expectation that it will continue. There's gotta be a flaw somewhere, but we haven't seen it yet. Uh, at the same time, the cost of energy as provided by uh, fossil fuels, um, gas and coal has been slowly increasing. So this is again from rewiring Australia. This is the cost of energy to households. And the cost of energy to households has got to around $5,000 a year, roughly on average now. And again, you can see the lumps and bumps in there, they're due to supply chain challenges. And the, the rise that you see plotted there was associated with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, there's been, a, there was a bit of a correction, but there'll be challenges now with the, um, uh, the conflict in the Middle East. So we'll see the same thing around um, energy prices for households will keep rising. Uh, the analysis that um, the Rewiring Australia team have done around electrifying a household, putting the solar on and locking in your delivery of energy says that the energy pricing, if you do that, you lock in a price of around per, per household of around two to three thousand dollars a year. There's a saving per household of around two and a half thousand dollars a year. If you, if, but you have to make the investments up front, and that's the challenge. Uh, that that um, that we're, that we're looking well that we're looking for an economic solution for. Um, so the the change isn't huge, right? The household doesn't look very different. It's just we're going to move when we electrify. We'll be moving away from gas heating, gas cooking, um, so gas hot water, gas house heating of the home, gas cooking, and petrol cars. We'll be using. Um, heat pumps for heating, electric vehicles for driving, and solar on our rooftops for energy generation. Uh, the uptake of electric vehicles um, is starting to track a little bit, and batteries actually, starting to track a little bit the way that solar has, with the Australians are starting to move on it. We're a bit slow compared to, compared to our enthusiasm for solar. Um, in 2021 Q3, there were one in 40 cars um, bought in Australia were electric. Two years later, it's now one in 15. And the ACT is leading because it's already one in five in the ACT of car, new cars being electric. So we're already starting to see the, the momentum in the electric vehicle space. 
the real the driver of all of this, as I mentioned, is because rooftop solar is so much cheaper. Uh, the um, pricing of electricity pricing at, in your home is typically, let's say, between 25 and 35 cents a kilowatt hour for energy delivered to your home, generated at a distance. A lot of the cost of the actual what you're paying is in the delivery. It's not actually in the generation. So putting rooftop solar on your home to, avoids all the generation costs. And the hardware itself and the installation over its lifetime works out around three cents, three cents a kilowatt hour now. Of course, you only get the solar um, in the middle of the day when it's being generated. To be, uh, to, to be more self-sufficient at home, you'd want to add a battery. And the same analysis says, and this one on the left, the graph shows you the breakdown of your pricing um, from taking into consideration the delivery and the, the, the cost of burning coal, the delivery of that, the various retail costs and charges. Uh, and to the right is the cost of solar. The cost of solar, if you add a battery now, it adds an extra 16 cents a kilowatt hour. But with time, those battery prices are going to come down. The price of solar is not going to come down much more than that's or extraordinarily cheap. But the battery price will come down with time. So it really does, it's, it makes sense now, but it's going to continue to, that's, that um, situation is going to continue to improve. And one of the other real benefits of, of electrification is that electrification is so much more efficient. So electric vehicles, electric heat pumps are so much more efficient than coal and gas burning. It's for the top, um, top left graph is showing your hot water heating. On the left is if you're, if you're running off um, a coal fire, uh, or is it gas? It's gas, sorry. Um, and the, the middle bar is, is resistive heating, which isn't as, um, is not much more efficient. And next to it is heat pumps, which are effectively a quarter of the uh, of energy consumption, four times more efficient than, um, than using the coal fire. Uh, electricity. And the same is true, I'm going to have to read it now, uh, for space heating, um, for stovetops and for electric vehicles, at least three times more efficient uh, than using coal fire generation or petrol and fuel um, for your vehicles. So this is where the analysis comes in around the savings um, that's, that's there for households to, uh, um, it, as well as being zero emissions is you do produce, reducing your electricity bills from around five thousand dollars a year down to around two thousand dollars a year. So a significant change, a significant opportunity for every household to save on their electricity generation. Uh, I'll back to this slide again, um, to, and because I've given you the Rewiring Australia, and most of that information you can find on the Rewiring Australia website uh, shows you this saving that is possible, um, and I don't know, sorry, the 42,000, um, I'm not sure about the $42,000, I'm not gonna to speak to that one. But the idea is that for each household saving around $2,500 a year. So if a community of 10,000 people um, is saving $2,500 a year, that's $25 million every year, which stays in that community instead of, and of, a half of that is goes offshore in the cost of oil and fuel. So there's that, and that's part of the argument that was put together and the, the structures that were put around the, what's known as the US Inflation Reduction Act, which you might've heard about, which is a, a huge investment um, and commitment in the US to electrification because of the savings that they can see. If we lock in pricing and it, flows not just in residences and, and ha households, it flows through to, to businesses and to industry. If we can, instead of continuing to ride this increase in energy pricing, if we lock in the price of energy, the things that we can do as, an, as, a, commu as, as a home, as a community and as a nation with those savings that we're not spending on burning fossil fuels. Uh, the, this, this creates all sorts of new opportunities. Um, and I'm gonna go through some of those opportunities that we're already seeing play out. Uh, some of which we're taking up and some of which um, are still there to be taken. In particular, while we've been really good on residential rooftops, we've got a huge opportunity still in commercial and industrial rooftops. 
The problem there is that typically the person, the, the occupant isn't the owner. We have to manage, they have to navigate that, um, what's called a split incentive. But there's, we have 30 gigawatts of solar on our rooftops in Australia, sorry, 20 gigawatts on our rooftops and 10 in the field. 30 gigawatts of, of, of solar in Australia already. And the analysis says there's 30 gigawatts roughly of rooftop available in commercial and industrial sites around Australia. Uh, there's the possibility to combine solar and agriculture. And we're seeing some uptake that uptake of that already, where you have co-grazing um, of animals with the solar arrays, but also co-planting where for crops and that benefit from um, a little bit of shade that with the, in the harsher conditions we have in Australia, you can actually um, co-plant uh, alongside solar panels, you can have your crops as well. And sorry, and that was another 34 gigawatts. And that's 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 co-planted with agriculture. Clearly, we also have a lot of space where we can just deploy solar um, mindfully, mind you. Uh, and then as we go down this path and our in, down this energy transi transition, there's a big opportunity for uh, reinventing our future. And we're already seeing that at play here. So I've put my little um, prompt in there about solar analytics, which is a company I start, I helped start. But we also, you also have in the ACT, you have Reposit, which is a, an in, innovator in um, uh, consumer engagement with energy, uh, bringing together solar batteries and uh, a virtual power plant opportunity. Uh, in regional Australia, there's opportunities. There's a company called Catch Power, which uh, does uh, hot water offsetting. Um, if you have excess solar, it immediately goes into to heating your hot water. It's a very low cost battery strategy. Rather than deploying a battery, you just store the, the solar in your hot water. And I had the, the pleasure of um, uh, visiting um, Armadale last week and going to um, the Armadale School. And in the picture there on the bottom right is uh, the Armadale School flywheel system. So they have four flywheels, which are used to offset. They have some really significant um, costs associated with uh, the tariff associated with uh, peak load. And their peak loads are in winter mornings. So they've, the, the operations manager at the school is a really proactive engineer. Um, and has worked with putting installing a battery in flywheels to try and shave off their peak loads in the mornings so that they can heat the, the schools, or heat the school. Um, it's a boarding school. Heat the school uh, and keep the prices down. And they've managed by combining this combination, taking around $100,000 off their electricity bill for each year. So a really significant saving. It's experimental, uh, but it's working. And um, the operations engineer says on, on, he likes to take the students around and show them. And then on the days when it's clearly not gonna work, he has them, they still run a, a coal boiler and he brings them down and gets them to shovel coal <laughs> into the coal boiler and say, which would you rather do? <laughs> uh, okay, so we, to, if we are, we are going to need to go on this electrification journey, uh, and we should, so every decision we make from now on in needs to be one around electrification, right? We don't have to do it, not all of us all have to do it tomorrow, but every time you make a decision, or if you know anybody who's making a decision about a new appliance or about a new car, encourage them to consider electrification as the lowest cost way going forward. To do that, when we do that, we're going to need to go from our current 30 gigawatts of solar to around 300 gigawatts of solar, and we're gonna need a similar amount in wind. And we've seen, I showed you in those bubbles, that we can do that over the course of a decade. We can actually push that, we can do it in eight years. Um, but we need to do more than that, because by doing that, we're only solving our own problem or our own um, uh, energy needs in Australia. And Australia has a long history of exporting. Um, we as a, as a nation uh, contribute about 1.2% of the world's emissions for our own needs. But our coal and gas experts 
exports <laughs> contribute another 7%. And the rest of the world is going to shift away from coal and gas. And so even if we can't bring ourselves to the, do the right thing and stop exporting coal and gas, the rest of the world is going to stop asking for us for it. And as an economy, we need to anticipate that and to see what impact that has on our own Australia's economic economy and well-being and growth. And so we have to anticipate a shift in our economy. We're not going to just start, keep digging coal um, out of the ground and pumping gas out of the ground and shipping it offshore unprocessed. The rest of the and there are parts of the world who are not going to have what we have, which is abundant solar and wind, which means it's easy for us to power our own economy. There are places with very high population densities and not a lot of land who are going to, are looking for imports of gas fuels uh, and or changing their own industry to, they won't be able to do the, the, um, the minerals processing that they have been doing historically. So Australia ships millions of, hundreds of millions of tonnes of of coal and iron ore offshore every year for somebody else to process. And then we buy some of it back. What we should be doing, what we should be doing is reinventing our future. Uh, we will have the, the low cost green energy that will allow us to do that mineral processing. We have the minerals. We should be able to develop an economy around those minerals processing. And the other area that we, you will have heard a lot about is around renewable hydrogen. And that is the, the potential as an export fuel in some format, hydrogen or one of its derivatives, that we can generate here in Australia and export to those nations that do not have the access to the green energy that we do. To get there from where we are currently, and these bubbles have shifted, so the, gray, the, the blues are where, what we've already done, we're at 30 gigawatts. We need to get to 300 gigawatts to meet our own needs. We need to get to one gigawatt, maybe three gigawatt, three, sorry, terawatts, 3,000 gigawatts or three terawatts to deliver the, the to, to develop an economy around those exports uh, and to deliver the energy, the kind of energy we've been delivering to the rest of the world. So it's, I think, well, I, I'd, I'd like to think I've, I've communicated that, um, A, we're already leading the world in some places. We're leading the world in solar technology developments. I haven't talked about that much, but I will. Uh, we are leading the world in rooftop solar. We have a really good opportunity to re lead the world in integrating that rooftop solar to have really smart grids, smart, stable grids. Uh, we continue to do strong research leading the world. And um, I don't have a picture, I should have put a picture up, but uh, just two weeks ago, uh, some of our leading scientists and engineers were recognized uh, with the Queen Elizabeth II Prize for Engineering, which is the world's best prize for engineering. Uh, Andrew Blake has included <laughs> for, um, for their work in uh, the development of solar cell technologies. So the, there's a particular solar cell technology which was developed at the University of New South Wales with Andrew Blakers, Martin Green, and uh, uh, Zhao and Awa, who were two scientists in the team, that is now in 90% of the modules being manufactured in the world today. And because of the way solar has gone, has been deployed and grows so rapidly, it means that 50% of the world's solar modules being deployed and powering, creating energy at the moment, use that technology. So the, Australia's already had this really significant role to play in energy technology development, solar technology development. And I think we still have, we still are like world leading in a number of areas and we still have a significant role to play. Uh, to deliver that um, vision of not just 300 gigawatts, but three terawatts of solar, uh, the 300 gigawatts we can deliver with the technology we have today. Uh, it's cost effective. All we have to do is roll it out. To develop those new industries around hydrogen and green minerals processing, we have to drive the price of solar down even further. So there's more work to be done. And the Australian Centre for Advanced Photovoltaics, which I have 
now the great privilege of, of leading, uh, has been charged with uh, working for Australia to develop those next generation technologies to take us to, from the current costs of solar uh, to the next generation of technology. I do have the numbers up there now. So we're looking at um, improving solar cell efficiencies from around 22%, module efficiencies from around 22% today to around to over 30% efficiencies. We're looking at installed cost of solar at 30 cents a watt from now around 60 cents to a dollar a watt. And to do so by 2030, it's a target known as the 30, 30, 30 targets, 30% 30 efficiencies, 30 cents a watt by 2030. And we're charged with the research that is gonna make that possible. Uh, the ACAP, the Australian Centre for Advanced Photovoltaics is a national centre. There's a string of universities um, on the side here. It has been running since 2013 under the leadership of Martin Green. It's formed an, like a really quite amazing network, which is recognised by some of our international um, colleagues as being unique in that it's in the collaboration that's generated from it. And it's made possible by the fact that we have long-term certainty in funding. So the first round of funding for 2013 was for eight years. We got halfway through, we got a two-year extension to 2022, and we've just got an extension out to 2030. And it creates this critical mass of researchers which has us all working together collaboratively rather than competitively. And together we see new ideas, we connect and collaborate. We've just had one of the, um, one of the uh, PhD students here from um, ANU spend a month at UNSW. We have another one there at the moment and we have a UNSW student coming to um, ANU in the near future. Those sorts of collaborations help build capacity uh, and establish, you know, maintain the momentum around our research capability. In addition, we were able to secure funding for research infrastructure, which has set us up for the next eight years of research. We've been delivering over the last eight years, I'll give you some examples of what we've delivered, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what we have planned. Uh, we've um, seeded new projects and new ideas around materials that have then gone on um, in, in novel materials for the next generation of devices. This got on to be independently funded, started within our centre, and it's been funded independently. We've started modelling capabilities around manufacturing costing. And one of the activities that we've got running at the moment is to look at whether Australia can, where in the supply chain, if we're going to invest in 300 gigawatts and then three terawatts of solar, what role can Australia have in that manufacturing capability? We shouldn't be buying at all. And at the moment, all of the technologies are coming from, from, from China, from one nation, and that puts our progress and at risk. Australia, uh, China's done amazing things in, in driving down the price, but now that we become reliant on it, we really need to make sure that we have a resilient supply chain. So where can Australia play in that supply chain? Uh, and we've been working on some AI uh, to really gather information quickly and learn from other, uh, other people's experience and our own more quickly around research outcomes to drive uh, change faster. We uh, invest a lot in capability and capacity building. So we actually run research uh, fellowship programs where we have all these individuals, there are just little stories up there on, on various people. Um, but the, these ones are particularly chosen because uh, we've, as in illustrations of what we've been able to do and the people have come through the university and they've either uh, started their own research programs at our university or have gone elsewhere to start research programs in solar. So we're actually seeding more research and more activity in other parts of the world and other parts of Australia and the world. We've got um, Bin Lu from ANU who is recognized with a Eureka Prize. We've got Anastasia, who, as Sarabi, who's now at Oxford. We've got a number of people who are at um, some of our startups. So Rhett Evans is at 5B. We have two startups that came from the organization. Uh, so Daniel Chen is at SunDrive. You might've heard about SunDrive recently. They've just started manufacturing a cell tech, a, a Australian cell technology in, in Australia, in Cornell, Cornell, just outside of Sydney. 
Pablo Diaz, he developed a technology under the program around solar module recycling, and that's um, been funded uh, and is being um, developed in the US. We, will, we have just awarded another 10 short-term fellowships, and we will run the same program again in, in, over the next years, uh, developing this capability, growing our strengths in solar. We've had these commercial outcomes, of some of which I've mentioned, SunDrive, uh, the student, it was a PhD student um, who started to develop a technology and decided he was more interested in actually commercializing that technology. And he ran it out of his garage for three years uh, and then out of a workshop for a few years. And now they have a manufacturing facility uh, which they're using to demonstrate scale up and then with a plan to scale up again. Um, Solar Cycle is the um, work that Pablo Diaz started and they raised 30 million US dollars uh, to scale up that technology in the US, sadly. And Solar Vision, which is also an interesting technology, um, which is looking at, uh, does it say, no, um, luminescence technologies, which allows us to do field in-field testing of quality of solar modules. So we can make sure that what we're deploying is performing as well as it should be, particularly over time. And that's also in the, it's, it's been, there's a small company been started and it's been funded by ARENA to take the technology to the next stage. We've developed new partnerships because as we build in strength and we build up partnerships and as Australian industries grow, so we've partnered with Sun Cable, with SunDrive, and with 5B, um, the others I've mentioned, 5B does a, um, a novel deployment process, which, um, which builds the solar arrays in a factory in a town center and then ships them out in a shipping container. And these can be deployed in the field really quickly from a shipping container. Uh, it actually cuts a lot of cost out of the uh, deployment piece, which is part of the drive to a 30 cents a watt deployment um, outcome. And we've secured and have largely deployed all the new infrastructure that um, that we were that we sought. And this in, in each of the case here, I'm just showing you examples. This it's not possible to show you all the work that's been done, but in this case, we have um, new methods of making materials, so we can explore the next generation of materials. That's in our in common, combinatorial sputtering at Monash University. At UNSW, we have new methods in analysis of solar cell technologies. And at ANU, amongst other things, there's photoemission spectroscopy, which is also helping us to uh, explore by looking deeply at the material qualities, the, and the, the materials and the cells uh, that are being produced. Okay, this is the future piece. So that was all of what we've done to date, a little bit of a snapshot of what we've achieved to date. So our future, piece uh, um, is looking at so tandem cell technologies are the technology that we are working on um, with really significant out outcomes already here at ANU on taking us to, towards that 30 percent uh, efficiency target uh, the um, Kylie's here yes so it's Kylie's uh, group has reported the for, for Australia at least the first 30 percent solar uh, tandem solar cells so a tandem solar cell is when you end up you start with a typically a silicon solar cell where efficiencies are around let's 25 percent is what we're getting 24 25 percent is what we're getting in manufacturing now and it's just about we might we might get to 26 26 and a half percent in the cell efficiencies and we're starting to reach fundamental limits to get beyond that what we need to do is add another layer on top and another layer of material that will absorb the light, some of the light that is not effectively used within silicon. So we'll give us a boost in performance. So we have two cells, one on top of the other, both collecting the light. Uh, and the, the work here, that, that's, that's what is what will get us to 30% and it's theoretically can get us to 40%. Uh, we're also looking at the research and working with our partners at the issues related to manufacturing and deployment at scale. And those include issues of performance uh, in the field. So when we put that solar out there, make sure it's performing as 
as as it should and as we expect it to to and that we maintain that performance sustainability of mo of the manufacturing processes and the deployment processes interesting an interesting fact is that um, at the um, manufacturing capacities we run today at this worldwide we produce around 300 gigawatts of solar cells a year and with that we're using around 15 percent of the world's silver so we need that to grow tenfold and clearly we can't do that and scale up the same amount of silver use so we're we're sustainability and, and that's just one example um, and every time one of those challenges come up the industry solve it solves it because it's a price ends up being a price point price pressure so a solution is found but that's the kind of work we're looking at and working on and that's the solution that SunDrive has developed is a silver free process uh, sovereign capability so can we manufacture locally and if we can where in the supply chain does it make sense so it's the the solar module you know comes from uh the, the there's a let's start with the silicon sil silicon it starts with the silicon processing quartzite dug out of the ground processed into silicon refined turned into ingots so crystals and then cut into wafers then turned into cells and then turned into modules and each of those stages of the supply chain we're looking at to see where australia might play a role and there's been a report on that in front of our colleagues at arena now and results will be out it'll be released before the end of the year and skills so this is about the people um, and again to deliver this growth that we expect to see uh, over the next decades we're going to tenfold growth we're going to need a, a, a commensurate growth in people uh, in deployment in integration in sales in finance in law all with a mindset around renewables and deployment and net zero uh, and the topic that comes up a lot and i think we need to talk about although i don't honestly think it's a big problem <laughs> is the is end of life and recycling i think it's it's a it's a challenge and it's one we will meet but it uh, as a comparison to municipal waste uh coal ash the waste from solar recycling is tiny and it's a problem that solar modules are designed to have a 20, 20, 25, 30, 40 year lifetime. We're going to have large volumes of waste, but those are 40 years away. And we will be, we are already working on solutions. I do not think we're going to have a waste problem, um, but it's one that we're, as a, as a, um, a mindful industry, we're mindful of the waste problem that's associated with, uh, with what we're producing. So, solar is disruptive. We're only, in Australia, we are 15% of energy demand, electricity demand in Australia. Worldwide, where it's only 5%. We're really just at the beginning. It's really just starting. And sometimes I like to think of the modules of today, like the mobile phones of the 1990s. Some people in the room look like they might remember those. I do. Um, uh, so we expect the technology to change. We expect the way it's deployed to change. We're expecting at least tenfold growth in deployment numbers. So we have to ramp up the skill sets. Uh, our colleagues at ARENA have been working on this long-term vision and developed their own narrative around ultra low cost solar, which they call the incredible ALK, uh, which um, on the premise that accelerated growth will come from, <laughs> accelerated growth in deployments will come from delivering ultra low cost solar and it'll enable a low cost of energy. And we're targeting $15 a megawatt hour. So that's for those of us used to residential electricity pricing at 30 cents a kilowatt hour. $15 a megawatt hour is one and a half cents a kilowatt hour. So, and that's the cost of energy that's gonna enable this 
um, green minerals processing and the hydrogen economy. It's probably possible at three cents a kilowatt hour, probably at five cents a kilowatt hour, but we'll target lower. Uh, so in summary, you'll be pleased to know, <laughs> Um, we've shown that we can scale, right? We've done it. We've been doing it for decades. We, another couple of decades, and we're going to be able to deploy at least 300 gigawatts of solar. We need to target more than that. We, the technology we have now is enough. We need to get a move on. And what we've learned is that the way you drive down the price of solar is by doing it. That's how, it's what we've learned over the last 20 years. The more you produce, the cheaper it gets. So we need to keep deploying. We need to not wait for some technology which might work. We need to work with the technology that does work and drive, continue to drive down the price. We know it will keep getting cheaper the more we deploy. And we need to develop these technologies uh, that will allow us to drive down these prices and then open up these new industries and these new possibilities, which would make Australia a renewable energy superpower. Words from uh, Fatih, Bir Fatih Birol, the um, executive director of the IEA, and that is that the transition to clean energy is happening worldwide and it's unstoppable. It's not a question of if, it's just a matter of how soon, and the sooner the better for all of us. And I think this, if, and Australia is so well positioned to benefit from it if we embrace it and run with it. So thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Renata. So we're going to go to a Q&A, but before we go there, I'd like to invite Minister Rattenbury to come up and present the ACT perspective of um, how we're going to get to 100%, how we got to 100% renewable electricity and how we're going to get to 100% energy, renewable energy and zero emissions. And um, maybe it'll be your friendly modular nuclear reactor at the end of your street, or maybe it'll be something else. Yuma, hello, and thank you, Andrew and Renata. Thank you. That was so interesting. I'm sorry I was a little late for it. Well, apologies, everybody else was a bit late tonight. I think punctuality is an important quality in life, but as a minister, occasionally that gets taken out of your hand. So I'm sorry I was not here earlier, but I am delighted to join for this annual opportunity to check in on where the ACT is up to and provide a quick update. I'm going to try and give you a whirlwind summary of what's happening in the ACT. As Andrew touched on, of course, the ACT has now had 100% renewable electricity for a number of years, and that leaves the question of, well, what do we do with the rest of our emissions? That has meant, that move to 100% has meant the ACT has cut its greenhouse gas emissions by 47% below 1990 levels, which makes us a leading jurisdiction on the planet for climate action. But with that, more than 60% of our emissions now come from transport, and more than 20% comes from fossil fuel gas use. Uh, so those are the challenges and the policy areas that we need to focus on. There's a clear commitment to sticking to 100% renewable electricity. We will need to continue to build supply over time with population growth and electrification of the city. But that's a reasonably understood pathway now and it's locked in legislation. So we'll continue to have that. It means we need to focus on those other areas. In response to that, the government has made a clear decision and commitment to electrify the city and to phase out the fossil fuel gas network. Uh, this is again, puts us at the front edge. It means we're having to answer a lot of questions that nobody else in Australia, or in fact, many other places have worked out yet. But I think it's really important that we have that goal of where we're going. It creates certainty. It makes it very clear to the community what the pathway is, and it provides us with a clear direction that we now need to fill in those gaps. In order to do that and to map from where we are to where we need to get to, we're now working on what we're calling the integrated energy plan. And what that plan is designed to do is to create the stepping stones to get us from where we are to where we need to be, to fill in the various policy elements and think about how do we drive that transition to remove our fossil fuel gas network over the next couple of decades. It's a big cultural shift. People who've been in Canberra for a while will know that we've, for a long time we were told that gas was the cheap and clean alternative. 
it is no longer either of those things. But there is a certain frustration in the community where people see, say, but the government told me to put gas in. And I understand that frustration, but the reality is we now have a different future we need to build. That pathway to electrification needs to be fair and equitable. Already around eight to 10,000 people in the ACT have cut off their gas connection. People are just doing it because they, they want to, they're committed, they know it's better. There's increasing research that shows having gas in your home is actually a significant health issue. So people are making that choice for themselves for a range of reasons, but there's also a whole segment of our community who cannot afford or don't necessarily have the knowledge or the research skills to work out how to do that for themselves. And I think there's a very particular role for government in assisting those parts of the community in particular to make that transition, to ensure we don't leave people behind and to be really conscious of the residualization issue. As we have fewer and fewer customers on the gas network paying for the infrastructure, the gas network is going to get extremely expensive for the remaining smaller group of customers. What the tipping point is, is still unclear. Nobody's worked that out. That's work we have to do, but it's work we need to be conscious of and we need to be thinking about how are we going to help people make that transition. The government's trying to take the lead in our own work. This year's budget created an $80 million program to begin to electrify government buildings to get the gas out of them. We've done an audit. We've got over a thousand gas assets in ACT government owned buildings. And so we need to think about, well, how do we get rid of those? But in creating that program of work, it's actually designed to also create an industry that does that work. We don't have people who can do it at the moment. Well, certainly not on a very large scale. And so we're also actually using our own facilities and our own transition to create that industry, have people invest in the training, the skills, the staff, the hardware to create an industry that does transitions away from gas and electrifies buildings. Let me touch briefly on transport in my remarks and then uh, we can get over to the Q&A. Transport is just such a huge sector at 64% odd of our emissions and there is no single answer to it. We need better public transport. We need to electrify our transport. We need better walking and cycling infrastructure. We need more micro mobility. We need to make it easy for people to get around town without emitting, emitting greenhouse gases. That's actually the transport challenge. It's not just about getting rid of emissions, it's about how do we reshape our city from what is a really car dependent one and give people alternatives so that they do not need to get in a fossil fuel driven car to get where they need to do and to live their lives and meet their needs. That's the macro policy question. We've released an electric vehicle policy, or zero, I should be clear, it's a zero emission vehicle policy because I don't want to eliminate the potential role of hydrogen, but clearly electric vehicles will play the biggest part in the short term. We've set a goal to have 80 to 90% of new vehicle sales in the ACT be zero emission vehicles by 2030. Now you might think we feel a long way from that, but if you haven't seen the data already, already for all of this year, 20% of new vehicle sales in the ACT have been zero emission vehicles. And see a few faces in the room who were at the session last night with our Norwegian visitors. It was great to spend time and it was a fascinating session. I got a lot out of it. We've also recently met a delegation from California. I was really surprised to discover that California only has 23% of their new vehicle sales as zero emission vehicles. I had assumed they'd be much further ahead of us. 23% of California is a lot more in absolute numbers, but it was fascinating to realize that actually we're up there with California at least and making substantial progress. What's so fascinating and listen to both the Norwegians last night and talking to the Californians is the sort of questions we're trying to work out. What sort of charging infrastructure, where do you need it? How do you retrofit into multi-unit developments? They're all actually grappling with the same problems. The big question of equity, how do you get electric vehicles to people on lower incomes? No, I think it's fair to reflect that our Norwegian visitor last night said, we haven't quite worked out either other than just getting more vehicles and making them cheaper. These are the challenging questions that lay ahead of us, but uh, it's exciting to have connections with those other jurisdictions and be working together on how to solve some of those problems. So the sum of my presentation is the ACT sits at the forefront, both definitely in Australia and globally in some of these questions, but there are a lot of questions still to solve. 
And uh, we look forward to many of you contributing to answering some of those questions as we continue to strive to deliver the challenge we have, which is to cut our emissions and create a safer future for future generations. Thanks very much. Um, Minister, one question I, I do have is, um, will the ACT include um, the equivalent domestic and international aviation in its greenhouse targets in the future? It's a good question. We actually include aviation emissions in our greenhouse gas inventory at the moment. Uh, obviously, that percentage will continue to grow as we cut emissions in other areas. Recently, there's been quite a bit of discussion about the use of biofuels in aviation and seen as a short-term pathway to cut aviation emissions because people are continuing to fly. But frankly, we also just need to do things like fix the train line to Sydney so people don't fly there. You know, so there's kind of two pathways we've got to pursue. And just before you sit down, um, we we run um, a, an annual solar thesis prize, mm -hmm. and um, this year it was shared between two people with two very different PhD theses. Um, one, Cheng Cheng, had a thesis called A Pathway to Decarbonised Energy, basically looking at 100% renewable electricity followed by energy futures. And um, um, the other is from Andin Bu, uh, Advanced Luminescent um, based characterization techniques for perovskite solar cells. So Cheng Cheng is on, um, on, uh, online in is away at the moment, but the other winner is here. And if you could come forward and um, shake the minister's hand. Thank you very much. So now we come to the Q&A and we will finish at 7.30 uh, sharp. And um, this is where your chance to ask lots of uh, awkward questions. <laughs> so perhaps I could start off with somebody on the in the online audience. Thanks, Andrew. So I have a question online from Julian McCarthy. Um, it says, great presentation, thank you. You describe impressive investment in technology through ACAP. However, to get to 300 gigawatts and 3000 gigawatts, the challenge will be not only technical, but will also require unprecedented collaboration of public, private and academic resources. Is there work being done on the governance constructs and forums needed to achieve this collaboration and accelerate investment to the required pace? Okay, yes. So <laughs> uh, there is, but not enough. <laughs> so there is research being done um, in that space. It's it's not under the remit of the Australian Centre for Advanced Photovoltaics and driving the price of solar down to the 30-30-30 targets. Uh, so not under what I am responsible for, but I am aware of the work that goes on in that space. Uh, there's also a, no doubt in the ACT, but I'm not familiar with it, but in New South Wales, we have what's known as Clean Co. And in Queen, or Energy Co, Energy Queensland and New South Wales have invested in an agency. One's called Clean Co, and the other's called Energy Co. And their um, their their task is to engage with community uh, and to try to to navigate the, the the significant challenge of engaging across the state uh, with regional Australia because that's where a lot of the solar will go out. So yes. Work's being done. Um, it's never enough and it's never fast enough, but that's the nature of all research, I would say. Just one direct question to Renata. Sorry. Oh, oh, oh. Questions to Renata um, and very good address. Thanks very much. Going back to your statement uh, very early on, about 30% of households. Uh, are powered by rooftop solar. Two parts to the question. What percentage of their total energy needs is being produced on average? And is there going to be a need for us to start promoting that many of them will need to add additional panels and batteries? Uh, okay, good question. So I don't have, it's literally, it's, it's been changing over the last two decades. I put solar, I put solar on my roof in 2008. Uh, a one kilowatt system cost $12,000. And 
So that clearly, I mean, then we're an energy efficient household. So that met about a third of our needs. <laughs> um, and I have just, I bought recently, two years ago, bought an electric vehicle and we put another six kilowatts of solar on our rooftop so that I could charge the electric vehicle. Interestingly, I put it on the south facing roof, which everybody thought I was mad, but it was the best piece of roof I had, uh, best real estate, roof real estate I had, and it's been fine. Um, so my answer is, it's an obtuse answer, but that is it's changing and there is no clear average around. Um, so systems, the average system size now is nine kilowatts. We're putting around 300,000 rooftops in a year. Last year, expect to be similar amount this year. Nine kilowatts is more than a household needs. Most homes are now being, um, because there's so much solar, they're actually being export limited. So new systems are, have um, often have constraints on how much they can export, which actually encourages them to put a battery on. And um, some recent research, which hasn't been released yet, has looked at uh, payback times of, for batteries under the, the recent price rises. So maybe not in the ACT, but the rest of the nation has seen significant price rises on the back of the increasing prices of oil and gas as a result of Russia invading Ukraine. As a result, battery payback times are down to five or six years now, which is less than the life of the battery. So those sort of little critical thresholds are, will be, continue to be passed. Either battery prices will come down or electricity prices will go up. More people will put solar and batteries on. Uh, it, people become more and more self-reliant. I don't know if, I didn't answer your question, but I gave an answer. <laughs> Basically, I was going to ask, do we need to change the message of this? And say, just because you've got a few solar panels on it, you've got to do this. Yeah. And that's not going to be enough to be fully electric. Right. Because my understanding of the $42,000 on the Paul Griffiths grant is that if you change the fully electric for all the energy needs uh, now, it will cost say you $42,000 between now and electricity. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that summary. Not just just, to, put, that, but, just yep. to put in context, um, when you look, work out how much solar you would need to run the entire world or an, an entire affluent country like Australia with zero fossil fuels, so your electrified transport heating industry, it works out at about 13 kilowatts per person. So if you've got three people in your house, that's like 40 kilowatts. Does the entire job. So if you're putting nine or 10 kilowatts on your roof, that's a very substantial fraction of what is your share of completely decarbonizing the planet because you've also got solar farms and wind farms. So another question, yeah. So going back to online, to be fair, we have got a question from Joe who says, how confident are we that we can address the energy attrition involved in making and transporting green hydrogen? Energy attrition. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how confident am I that we are going to solve that problem? Um, that's it will be that's part of driving the price of the cost of solar down so low is that it's not necessarily efficient, but it's low cost. So it, it accounts for the inefficiencies in the process. Uh, the Australia will is un, and in fact, there's a fellow, if you're interested in the hydrogen economy, there's a fellow called Michael Liebrich, who does a fabulous um, assessment on a regular basis of where hydrogen is going to play a role in the economy. Um, and he's far less optimistic than most. Uh, the, there are parts of the world that are that with very high population densities and uh, challenges have challenges with solar and wind resources that are looking for alternatives and their alternatives will be based on the hydrogen economy or nuclear to meet their energy needs. Andrew, do you? Um, yes, of course, most people have got solar and wind, even you know, Japan has got 50 times more offshore wind than it actually will ever need. And um, Indonesia has 2000 times more offshore floating solar in calm equatorial seas that never see large wind and waves than it will ever need. So yeah, most people have got an awful lot of solar and wind. Uh, okay. Um, thank you, Renata, for a very interesting presentation. Um, a slightly curly one. What strategies are being put in place to ensure um, 
in the um, manufacturing process that workers are not going to be exposed to risk of similar to silicosis? Uh, good question. Uh, so there, there, in any chemical manufacturing process, there are risks and hazards. Uh, the, and there are different standards around the world for what is acceptable practice. I have been on the manufacturing lines in China and the, 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 there is, the standards are high and they're high for a number of reasons. There's, for, for a start, quality and cleanliness. So people don't actually get exposed to very much anyway because they're removed from the processes. In, interestingly, more and more the processes are being automated and they take people out of the manufacturing process itself. The, I understand now a number of what the module assembly lines, which is where you take the cells and you turn them into the, the modules that you know, are actually run in the dark. There, isn't, there aren't people in the room anymore. It's all automated and it's run in the dark. So uh, I, I can't hand on heart say that it's everything is a pure process, but yeah, it's people, absolutely people are thinking about it. And it is, and it's more than the you know, exposure of, of people to health consequences in the workplace. It's waste streams. Like what happens to the chemical waste? How is that process been handled? That is, it's, there is a, a mindfulness and an awareness around those challenges uh, and the industry is moving uh, to address them. Uh, so, I, but, but I, you know, not, I can't say hand on heart, I, it's a pure process. <laughs> uh, the hydrogen economy has become a very popular term. As a chemist, I look at it with rather mixed feelings because hydrogen is also the smallest molecule you can think of, and this, it escapes very easily into the atmosphere. There is now increasing research which shows that the global warming potential of hydrogen is tenfold that of CO2. Now imagine you people driving hydrogen-driven cars. It's unavoidable that the hydrogen will escape, and it, it will be much worse than for methane, for example, which is a bigger molecule. Is there any way of stopping Toyota, Hyundai to advertise hydrogen as our future for driving cars, driving airplanes and trucks? Um, so I think the economy around hydrogen, the economics around hydrogen will slow down the reality of hydrogen um, because it's the, if, yeah, it's the earlier question around the efficiency of the process uh, is that's a huge challenge. The efficiency of of transporting and storing the gas is a huge challenge. I used to work. I actually did a postdoc here at ANU <laughs> um, in electronic materials engineering, and we were running processes using hydrogen. And I know the safety standards and and challenges that we faced in transporting, storing delivering it into the labs, disposing of it. It's, it's, there are such significant challenges around hydrogen. Um, I don't have an answer for how to convince some of these nations that it's not economically or safe, like not viable, but um, it's, it's the future. Andrew, do you have a, I don't, I don't have a, I, I'm not a big, I'm cautious about the hydrogen economy in the long run. Um, well, one observation is that hydrogen cars are being outsold by EVs 400 to 1. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, Mr. Toyota is going to have their very own Kodak moment. They've, they've made the wrong bet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So we're jumping back to a question online from Bernie Ingle. Uh, they say, I'm in Toowoomba Renew, one of the 10 community partners selected by Rewiring Australia across Australia as a project to progress theirs and our work. I would love your advice on a low hanging fruit goal that we can influence locally and regionally. I'm thinking, Andrew, have you got an idea? Low hanging fruit. Uh, solar EVs. Sorry? Solar on rooftops. <laughs> solar on rooftops, yes, you can answer it. <laughs> um, so, absolutely, solar on rooftops. Um, financing and education. Um, supporting people because, and uh, yeah, electric vehicles, um, de-risking or de it's not even the risk. 
you know, the, the, um, the challenge that people, the fear that people have around EVs is the range anxiety and, and all the stats show you that the only people who have range anxiety are people who don't drive electric vehicles. <laughs> Once you drive an electric vehicle, no range anxiety, it's fine, you realise it works. Um, so education, uh, familiarisation and help with the finance around electrification. I think is, and then there's the there's the, the issue with the split incentive around rentals, which would be great to solve as well. I don't think it's low hanging fruit though. <laughs> uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, excellent. Uh, I'm not too sure who would be best qualified to answer this one. So anyone who's prepared to take it up, it's to do with mega projects. And I'm not a big fan of mega projects. And I'll give you three examples. One is Snowy 2, which was dishonestly announced by Malcolm Turnbull a number of years ago in terms of its cost. Uh, now the, uh, what is it, the chickens are coming uh, home to roost on that. There was also that uh, huge project, I forget the name, in the Northern Territory. I think it was the second 17 gigawatt project for export to Singapore. Oh, that is cable. either yeah. Sun the Cable. Sun Cable Tuck. Uh, that is either stalled or fallen over. And I was reading in uh, Renew Economy re, uh, just a few days ago, uh, Fortescue Metals has dropped a massive renewables hub uh, as it reorganises Pilbara Energy plans. Uh, now that one, <laughs> I think, will be massively scaled back if it doesn't fall over completely. I suppose what I, my, my question uh, in brief would be the dangers of these blue sky massive projects and will we see further examples of this? Because on the commercial side, as opposed to rooftop solar, these things are, are truly huge. And if they worked, it would be fantastic. But there's three large projects which appear to be stalled or dead in the water. So, so I'm happy to answer that. Uh, I think in the, so when um, the research started on solar in the 1970s, 80s, the idea that we would be contemplating powering the world, 50% of the world's energy needs being met by solar would have been considered the same thing, a waste of time, why are you bothering with solar, right? You actually have to have some people with long-term visions and big ideas to make things happen. And they don't necessarily happen in the way that you think they will when you start uh, with any of these big ideas. So Snowy Hydro will be complete and it will deliver a low cost of energy, despite the, um, there is not a single infrastructure project in Australia that has ever come in on, <laughs> on its first budget, uh, you know, estimate, its first budget estimate. Um, and, you know, the same, we, if the same questions were asked with the original Snowy Hydro project, it would not have gone ahead. It's going ahead, it will work, and it will provide a battery of a nation for when we have a, a large scale renewable deployment. The Sun Cable project uh, stalled, um, and it, it is a big picture, big vision project, but I actually think, you know, there's, it's, it's private money in the Sun Cable project. If you've got big thinkers ready to, to have big ideas, I mean, the, so, and not a big fan, Oh, sorry, I've got to be careful about my language. So I think Tesla um, changed and accelerated our thinking around electric vehicles by putting out a car that was something that was uh, something that was a big, a big expense, big expense, an expensive car, but one that was aspirational rather than a little pocket EV that, that's half the size of what you used to drive in and, and with half the range. So sometimes you need some big fingers and some big challenges and ideas to bring about change more quickly. And I think that's what we're seeing with these projects and having the, looking at the big problem we've got to solve and saying some of these need to be, things need to be really big steps and being brave about them will take us on that journey, even if we don't actually get the thing at the end of it, but we will, be, we will have made progress along the journey. And I, I do recall the derision with which the ACD government's announcement that they're going to go to 100% renewable electricity was greeted. I mean, this is just nonsense, isn't it? Well, <laughs> it was done early. And um, if I 
recall correctly, uh, the ACT government actually made money, a lot of money, during mm -hmm. the pandemic when prices, well, the, the inflation when prices went very high. Yeah. So I knew we went back to the shoe as quickly as that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so we've got a question from Jesse Parrish online. It says, thanks, Renata. We hear a lot about needing gas as a transition fuel. How do you respond to this? It was, it was gas, right? Yes. Not wind, add gas. Yeah. So <laughs> gas as it, it is, um, but it's going to have it's going to be short lived. Uh, is uh, aspirationally, at least for me, I think we need to make it. We need to move faster on deployment of solar and wind. And uh, gas is offering a, a lower emissions, but not a lower cost <laughs> uh, transition. But we need to move faster on wind and solar, and then we will not need and batteries and snowy hydro, <laughs> and we won't need the gas. Uh, in any case, gas in the electric the national electricity market has fallen from ten percent four years ago to three percent. <laughs> So this is not a transition fuel. <laughs> it's transitioning out. <laughs> <laughs> Laughing gas led recovery or something like that. <laughs> okay, enough. Yeah. Yes, while we're on gas, if, gas, if I might uh, direct a question at the minister. Oh, yes, um, and it's really a statement of... He must have known I was coming. <laughs> I, 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 well, I'll direct this at Renata then. <laughs> we, we, it, situation with high-rise multi-unit properties. Uh, we, we live in one with 350 units built 12 to 15 years ago when gas was all the go and everybody said gas was the thing to do. All the hot water system is centrally done on gas. <laughs> Uh, 350 units. Now, how are we going to go about changing that with 350 separate owners? And I haven't heard anywhere, and the, the government's talking about a thousand gas uh, buildings and so on that they'll need to deal with. I don't know how many thousand multi unit apartment blocks there are that have got gas hot water, given it was all the go 15 years ago. Can, so, can I ask, there were, were there, are there 350 individual gas heaters? No, no it, it, it's the, the hotel system where the hot water is all done on the top floors and mm -hmm. in the towers, um, and then they, it comes down in banks to everybody like that. Mm -hmm. So, it's corporately yeah. owned, Yeah. So uh, it's, so it's the not inter 350 individuals. Right. So, it's, it's a, an infrastructure change within the building? And it sounds like it's exactly what he's looking at solving on the government buildings. And when they solve it on the government buildings and they develop the skills and the technologies to do that, it will be possible to do it on the multi-owner private buildings, recognising that that's a challenge. But, that, you know, that sounds like exactly what they're trying to do is um, demonstrate it works. And if, how it will work. If you've got a gas boiler, you can just swap it out for an electric boiler. That doesn't sound very hard. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's water <laughs> <laughs> You think of the impact on the electricity system in the building, which suddenly you've got 350 electric operators. Users. Uh, 300. Uh, that's it's all. So the, ni this is the nice thing about electricity is that it's an en for me, it's an engineering challenge, and we've got engineering solutions for that. There'll be timing, there'll be storage, there'll be incentives around tariffs that will motivate change and incentivize, incentivize behavior. Uh, it's, it will flatten out the, um, well, we will optimize <laughs> the system. We'll have, we already have excess solar in the middle of the day. So we need to incentivize people to be charging their cars and heating their hot water in the middle of the day. And then the cost of energy will go, well, well I won't go, it, it, because just for the reference, I don't think cost of energy is going down. But what we want to do is stop it going up. <laughs> um, so we'd be able to control the you know, cost of energy for people. The, the, yeah. So I, I, think, I think these are all engineering solutions that are, and the technologies exist today. It's just that they're going to be bespoke solutions for different 
applications and we have to work out what those are with each of them. Okay, so we've just got a couple more minutes, um, just two quick questions. So, yep, uh, very fast. Uh, I was wondering about uh, the move from lithium to salt, sodium batteries. We know that they are bigger and more heavier. How is Australia moving in that direction? They are cheaper. Yeah, so um, it's a, a similar answer and that it's, uh, it's a technology solution. There'll be different technology solutions for different applications. Um, lithium is uh, lightweight, high power, short, relatively short storage solution. Uh, the, and I don't know much about the salt batteries, but I do know about the, um, the flow batteries. So those are large, fixed, you don't want, you're not, they're not going on transport, um, long duration battery storage. So there's going to be different battery chemistries and different battery solutions for different purposes. Um, you know, cars, planes, lightweight, high power, um, uh, residential or community scale, grid scale batteries can be um, the, the large flow batteries. The challenge, the beauty of solar is that the technology is the same, whether it's a solar cell the size of your fingernail or the solar cell that you see made into modules and then deployed in there, millions. It's the same technology produced on the same lines, the same thing over and over and over and over again, which has given us the, the significant price advantage. And that's fast learning that's driven down the costs. So that's the beauty of solar. And so lithium ion batteries actually have the same sort of benefit. I don't know if you've seen what's inside a car battery or a home battery solution. But it basically, it, it looks like a AAA, AA battery, just lots of them, right? All configured together. So they do have the same scalability advantage, lithium ion batteries, which is why the, we can expect the price of lithium ion batteries, provided we can source the materials, to <laughs> continue to fall. Um, the other battery technologies with a bespoke battery technology for every different solution, it's much harder to drive the price out of those solutions. Okay, well, I think that's probably a good note to finish on. So the future of the um, of energy <laughs> is solar. Is the, absolutely, it's solar. Yes, um, and we we yeah we. Sorry, I'm going to. My punchline is that we we have what it we have the technology to that is viable and economic that will work now, and we should deploy it as fast as we can. We shouldn't wait for. Um, a unicorn, because unicorns don't happen, <laughs> um, like small modular reactors, right? There is not one working commercially in the world today. So the idea that we should wait for that, and to be honest, waiting for that to happen is just allowing us to run gas and coal for longer. We need to act on what we can work with today. It's cost effective, it works. We need to do so to meet our own commitments internationally and to our kids. <laughs>